All right, I think we are ready to go here. <clears throat> Get started. This is our welding lecture three. I know we've had those uh, welding videos in there. Uh, the gentleman learning or, or teaching you how to weld with the stick welder and the MIG welder, and I think that's pretty good. We're going to go ahead today and get into some other processes like spot welding, oxyacetylene welding and all that. I know some of you are saying, hey, you had oxyacetylene welding at the end of one quiz and we haven't gone over that yet and, and all this other stuff and well, you know, it was kind of like a process of elimination. We had gone over all those other welding and if it wasn't that, then it had to have been the last one. So I'm just trying to Instead of just having you actually just regurgitate everything was to get to the next level. And so if you get one wrong, it's not going to kill you. We've got a midterm exam that's worth 100 points. So, you know, these quizzes are only worth 10 points apiece. So if you're not doing so well on these quizzes, don't worry about it. Now, some of you are saying, hey, I want to know what I got wrong so I can get them right and this and that. Well, we're going to have a review. If I give you the questions and answers, which some of you are asking me for and all bent out of shape and what have you, then I have to come up with new questions for the midterm and final. If we leave it the other way, I can just take all the quizzes we've already had, which you'll get a review on, and probably what I do is, what's good about this uh, blackboard is when there's a quiz, it shows you which ones, uh, what the percentage rate was on each question. So it tells me which questions most people got wrong or right. And so then I can review the ones that most people got wrong. And so that way you should be in pretty good shape for some of you that are struggling. I see some twos and threes coming out here. But, you know, again, the intent is you're supposed to listen to these integrity sessions and you're supposed to download those notes and take notes, fill in the blanks as you go along, and read them three or four times, then take the quiz. If you're taking the quiz and trying to look them up on your notes at the same time, it's not going to happen. Five minutes goes by too fast. I know I'm giving you eight now because the questions are getting to be about ten questions and what have you. It's a little more difficult and more intense. <laughs> But, you know, if not, anybody could get 100 on all these quizzes. If I gave you three days, I mean, it's online. You know, you're at home. What am I going to say? It's the honor system. Don't go ahead and look them up, you know, on another computer while you're on this computer. You know, it's just not going to happen. That's why I'm not doing that lockdown uh, respondus thing and all that. It's just like, you know. That, that doesn't seem to work either. If you're going to cheat, you're going to cheat. So that's why I have to just do the time method. And go from there. And the intent is hopefully you'll learn enough of this uh, where you'll know something about welding when you're through. Now, the, the deal is just don't cheat. Um, the whole reason you're taking all these courses and learning all this stuff uh, at the college level, at the university level, I should say, is uh, that you know something, you're prepared for the job. You know, and if you're really not interested and excited about this, well, don't take the course and don't major in this. I mean, I just don't get it. All right. Uh, to me, you know, I I dabbled at welding for a while. Never really liked it because it made all this noise and, and, and you get caught on fire if you don't know what you're doing right. You know, I was always scared of it. And then I started really working at it, reading about it first, and then actually getting the equipment, took some classes in it. And then realize how much quicker it is just to weld the bead and, and put things together versus drilling holes, having to bolt something together, pop rivet and all that. And, and, and welding is just beautiful. You know, it saves a lot of time and you can put really thick parts together and then you can clean up the, the beads and it looks beautiful. You know, you see those nice little beads if they're done correctly. Now, if you don't know how to weld, yeah, it's awful. But you just practice. That's the deal. You have these like welding little pieces of steel, we call them welding coupons, and we just lay one bead after the other until they got good, until you practice well enough, and then you're good to go. But man, it's just a big time saver. And so, you know, that's that's when I finally, you know, I fell in love with welding and said, this is good stuff. But the deal we're covering this, you're saying, is like, 
most things, there's still a weld somewhere on it. You may see some rivets and screws in that for items that have to be serviced, taken apart, or whatever. But if it's the frame of something or whatever, and they don't expect to take it apart, they weld it together. It makes for a stronger, more secure bond because, you know, pop rivets or just studs or anything, uh, the nuts could loosen up and uh, it's just so much quicker, easier, stronger if something is welded together. And welding is a big thing. Uh, they even use plastic welding and all that. Same type of concept. You know, obviously it's different. But um, the way it fuses things together, I mean, you just can't beat it. All right, so we'll continue on. This is our second part of welding. Uh, so let's see if it's going to work here. Yeah, resistance welding, where you're uh, getting a resistance between the two. Uh, spot welding, you've probably seen these robots and eh, eh, spot welding your car together and stuff like that. So anyhow, resistance welding, a process in which contacting metal surfaces, and here's your two copper electrodes that go zzz, zzz, are, uh, are joined by the heat obtained from resistance to electric current flow. So they, they hit each other and that current wants to flow through these two and then it conducts through these two points right in the center here, works its way up the heat and then it fuses it together. So and then it really goes below the melting temperature of these base metals but then you press in on it and because it gets hot enough it will fuse it together. So you do have to use pressure with this. So the maximum heat is generated at the point of greatest resistance, which is at the surface of where the parts come to contact, like we said, right in between here. And then the force applied uh, before, during, and after forges it, uh, the pieces together, so the coalescence will occur. You can see there's a spot welder there. So there's different types, uh, different shapes is what they mainly are to get into different positions, I guess that one they're welding a car door or the frame around there or something. So, But, uh, you know, like I said, they can come in all sizes and shapes. Uh, again, it's, it, it heats it up below the melting temperature, but then you're able to press them together and that fuses those two hot spots in the middle there. The amount, and this is like the one we actually have in the lab, one of these Hobart types, handheld ones. <laughs> Some of you have made your little sheet metal tote trays with that. Anyhow, the amount of heat employed at the time period are related to the heat input required to raise the temperature. So, depending, you know, it's mainly for sheet metal, but, you know, there's different thicknesses of sheet metal, so you have to have it set right. And if it's too thin a metal and you hold on too long and goose it up too much, zzz, you're going to burn a hole right through it. Then if you don't give it enough, if it's thicker sheet metal, then you can just pull the two pieces apart. So you have to kind of, you know, play with it a little bit. Here's a better one where you put the big piece in and you hit the foot pedal. And these are water cool. They have antifreeze running through it. And what's good about that, it keeps it at a constant temperature. The problem with like this one as some of you noticed uh, in the lab, you got to be the fifth or sixth person in line to do it. These things were getting pretty hot, and it would like, if you held it too long, you'd burn a hole right through your metal. Uh, they start getting hot. So uh, this keeps it at whatever temperature you want. You got all these different settings. You, know. you get what you pay for. It's a lot more expensive. I really don't want all of the antifreeze leaking all over our carpet. So this little bad boy seems to do the job. We can only get so many people using it uh, in an evening anyhow, so it seems to work well enough. All right, then we look at here. Uh, another diagram here with the electricity. It gets in the middle, the hottest part, and works from there. There's your spot wells. Okay. Now I think this says it all. Here's the two pieces separated, and then you clamp it on there, and bzz, bzz, got two welds here, and there it is. Boy, that just 
I'll tell you, without that slide, I don't think you guys would ever understand this process. All right, anyhow, pressure. Just enough pressure to hold the pieces together. Weld time ranges from, what do we got, tenth hundredth of a second to 0.63 seconds depending on the thickness of the metal the electrode force and the diameter of the electrodes themselves yeah depending you know the thicker they are obviously and the bigger the machine the more you can pump out and then the whole time thereafter because you gotta let it cool so depending how thick how much weld time there was because it was thicker you may have to hold it a little longer uh, weld currents can range from 4,000 to 24,000 amps and then your different types of mild steel how thick it is and then if you look that workpiece thickness can range from anywhere to eight thousandths of an inch pretty thin stuff uh, a piece of paper is three thousandths of an inch so you know um, thicker than paper to up to an eighth of an inch which is pretty thick Copper electrodes range from 5 to 50 inches in length, depending if you're trying to weld really deep inside of something. So it just depends on what you want. Obviously, the longer the electrode, the more expensive since it's made out of copper. And then it shows you different projections. Oh, projection welding, where uh, you have it already made in here, and it's come down, and you see they have these little protrusions here. They come in and then it zaps it at those two points. Uh, they also have it where they've got rollers where they can seam weld them together like that. All right, so spot welding requires no filler metal or fluxes. Can be used for high speed production, easily automated. As you saw, robots spot welding cars together. And if you have never seen that in one of these commercials, I can show you one. Does not require much skill, obviously, if you can automate the whole thing. Used primarily on sheet metal, uses a non-consumable, low-resistance copper alloy electro. Then we have Electro Slag Welding, ESW. Yes, another acronym for your vocabulary there. A specialized version of, I think we got into sub-arc, so submerged arc last time. Uh, and whereas welding big thick pieces together, had tandem two, three, and even four uh, big copper spools, kind of like a big variation of MIG and flux core, and dumping that material in there. This is so you can do it vertically. So a lot of times you'll see this for even shipbuilding making water towers when they're welding those sheets together for water towers and all that yeah they're making something that they're going to use out in the ocean and then this will go down in there and then this will and so and then it's running up a little track just like it goes vertically when horizontally the sub arc works which is easier obviously to use than having to do with all this mess but they were able to figure out a way of making sub arc work vertically, and that's what this is basically about. And it has all this stuff to hold in the flux and all that that's dumping in there. And then it has shoes uh, on either side that hold all that stuff. And has water coming in and water coming out to cool the weld and keep it a certain temperature so it doesn't get too hot or too cool. Again, a schematic and then it runs up vertically you know it's a wire type wheel thing pretty heavy duty I mean it gives you a big thick weld I mean you figure a water tower is not just made out of thin sheet metal it's holding water water's heavy so it's thick plate so in one pass though you can weld this together so extremely high metal deposition rates ability to weld thick materials in one pass again this is electro slag welding High quality weld deposit, minimize joint preparation and fit up. Mechanized process, which once started, continues upon completion, whether it's a 10 or 20 foot uh, piece that runs the track. Minimum distortion, no spatter, and minimal uh, finishing is required. No arc flash. 
So no helmets is required. High filler metal utilization. Again, it's it's like the sub arc, the submerged arc process, only it's going vertically. Has a few little more parts there to hold all that material in as it's going up. If not, all that flux and all that stuff would fall out. Vertical position only used on ferrous materials. High proportion of preparation time. Aligning the copper shoes, etc., to climb the wall. Now, this, let's see if this is going to work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> Everything changes. And, uh, yeah. Okay, different welding systems that these people sell. Now, do they have it? Uh, yeah, there it is. Going up. This wasn't as good as I thought. And I guess they've changed their website. Time I turn around, they're changing websites. So I'm sorry, I had this all set up. But that's the way it goes. Oh, there's one. There it is going up. They had it all set up. I knew it was in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. This one looks like they're doing. Yeah, this one's not going up. This one's going like a sub-arc. And then there's one, I think, that's going up vertically. Yeah, and here it is. Yeah, vertus lag, they call theirs. Anyhow, it's going up. See, they have to set all this stuff up, make sure it's right, and then it runs together. There it is, it's set up. So this one does, what, about three, four foot lengths at a time? the fit up for it and then it runs up does it all in one so it tells you this is going through two inch thick in 30 minutes instead of 18 hours required by the sub arc process so so this can go six feet high two inches thick bridge flange and 30 minutes instead of 18 hours so that's not bad so anyhow so I guess there was something on that there it is. Yeah, I mean, a little bit of setup time, as you can see, but shh, you one, run one pass and you're done. So, it just depends on what you're looking for. All right, let's go back to Blackboard here. There we go. All right. Then we have SW. Go. Oh, not another acronym now. Is this submerged arc welding? No, no, no. This is just stud welding. Stud welding, you say? Yes, if you just need like studs sticking out somewhere, let's say you need to boat a, uh, or uh, you need to mount, let's say a generator on top of something, or you know step down generator or um, a motor onto something, and instead of having to drill holes through a metal plate, putting a nut and a bolt through it, and all that, you can just. Bzz, Put these four studs and then you can just put nuts on there real quick and easy not having to drill and all that plus since it's welded on there it doesn't leave a hole that could leak water or something or you name it or you're drilling through a plate that was just painted and then it's going to rust there a uh, process in which an arc is generated between the stud and base metal a specially made gun is used partial shielding may be obtained by the use of ceramic ferrule Surrounding the stud, all right, that's to keep in the heat, uh, shielding gas, or flux may or may not be used. All right, so this kind of just shows you. Pretty simple setup. Look it up to the little power supply there. There's the gun, and then you bring it down, and it'll put a stud in there. And here's all the different types of studs. I've got some plates in my office I can show you, but basically... Uh, you can see right there where that's the part where it's going to fuse into there and then weld it right around it. And then they have some where if you're making stuff all day long, you can put it in this cabinet and weld these studs to a plate. You know, if it's for some part that's going to go in somewhere. The other one was portable for out in the field. And here this guy is. Obviously, he's putting these studs in here to hold rebar so when they pour the concrete it'll keep it spaced the certain space that needs to be I guess this is something that must be a commercial job that requires it to be done right versus your house where um, 
they just unravel that stuff and try to hold it down the best they can and, and put it on chairs, uh, those little plastic chairs or metal chairs, uh, those metal little pieces. Uh, if they're running those tendons, those cables through there. Sometimes they have cables through your uh, for your slab or sometimes they run this welded wire fabric. Okay. You know, you already see that wire mesh that they unravel. Now I think the the norm is that it has to be at least galvanized because the stuff rusts and then wherever it rusts it's coming apart. They find out for all these old bridges it's coming apart where the rust is on this actual uh, wire that was supposed to hold it all and keep it together. So anyhow, it's just one thing after the other. You would think that was kind of obvious, but in fact they should use stainless. But you know, they, they try to keep it down as cheap as they can. And as you can see here, here's where they welded it to this I-beam here. And there's the ceramic ferrule that breaks off later on these. You don't really need them. But this looks like a heavy duty setup here, what they're doing. Let me see if this is anything good here. Let's see. Oh, didn't like that, huh? Alright, well, if it didn't like it, then we won't do that. Sometimes some of these have changed and, uh, and they've become a malicious site or something. My uh, Norton antivirus doesn't like it. What I did at school didn't matter because the IT support have the best virus protection, so they say. All right, so anyhow, studded ceramic ferrule against the workplace. Remember I said it had a little point on some of them. And here's the, the outside of the ceramic ferrule that surrounds the whole thing. You wouldn't see this. That's a cutaway view. And then the stud lifts and an arc is drawn. You know, you turn it on. So it's got to leave a little bit of a space. Uh, control times out. Stud plunges into molten metal. And, and there's settings on that depending how thick the metal is and what you're welding and the diameter of the actual stud. And then it fuses in there, see, and gives you a nice weld all the way around. So it's a nice sealed, perfect hole. There's another one, different types of setups, depending on what you're doing. We had an old one that just did one thing, but there's a lot of nice stuff out there, and it's it's a lot cheaper than they used to be. Let me tell you. Here's one. Let's say uh, if you're assembling something on circuit boards with a metal plate or something, and inside a factory. There it is. Again, here's a schematic, you know, timer, the control unit stud. Obviously, you're going to have to ground it if you're welding it. So high cost savings when compared to drilling, tapping, or welding studs with like a stick welder or something. Does not destroy water tightness or weaken the base metal. Limited to mild and low alloy steel, stainless steel, brass, and aluminum. Okay, then we have oxyacetylene welding, which we kind of hit a little bit on. So, touch base on that. A gas welding process which produces a coalescence. Again, we're mixing those metals. By heating them with a gas flame or flames obtained from the combustion of acetylene with oxygen. Oxyacetylene. O A W. All right, not oxy argon, but oxy acetylene. And acetylene, yes, yes, it's combustible. Filler metal may or may not be used. Kind of, you know, like with the TIG process, the G T A W, where we were just using that filler rod and making those nice little dimes on top of each other that I was talking about. Pressure may or may not be used. And this is some of it, it looks a little blurred here, but you have a cylinder of acetylene. You'll, you'll notice the oxygen cylinder, it's the same as like in a hospital. You know, these are usually green and they're tall like that. Uh, acetylene are shorter and wider. They usually have some type of force material, even if it's balsa wood or something. 
that keeps it from just becoming a liquid, then it's very inflammable. And you always leave these upright. Don't ever let an acetylene tank on its side. Again, these are combustible. Oxygen, yeah, it'll help fuel a fire, but it's just oxygen, all right? It's not going to blow up unless you, you know, have some source of flame or, 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 or combustive. Uh, but this is, okay, this is what... <laughs> Uh, actually does the burning and then the oxygen makes it gets you a hotter temperature adding more oxygen to it all right and there's your flux that you tap your uh, rod into and then you can put a cutting attachment to make oxyacetylene cutting but you've probably seen those torches they let it up and hit that here's the welding tip but then you can also put on this torch part all right, and again, here's our welding torch, our hoses, and then um, we have our acetylene. Usually, your uh, acetylene should be a red or black hose, and your oxygen should be green. And when you hook them up, so you get the right holes to the right side on this welding torch. One's a left-handed, one's a right-handed thread. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then for the cylinders, this way you can see what is the pressure inside the actual bottle that you have, you know, the welding cylinder. And then this one, depending how much you turn this in to get more pressure, is your actual working pressure. Now at the tip it may be a little different because it's had to go through all the hoses. But this is roughly what your working pressure is on this side. And you should see it's lower. And then here is what's in the tank. And they have all these check balls and different things. So if there's an accident, something blows out, it doesn't cause it to go the fire into your tank and more fuel the fire and have that explode and, or shoot off like a rocket and all that. We'll get into uh, bottle safety and all that. So again, our acetylene hoses, uh, red or black, I couldn't do black because it didn't show up so well, so I did a gray here, but red or black and your green for your oxygen here. And then you look, here you don't have to have as thick a welding lens. The flame isn't as bright as our other welding, you know, MIG, TIG, and all that other stuff. So uh, the shades aren't as dark. And then to strike the arc to get it going, they have these little flints that you put on the end there that strikes this, you know, versus having to light a match and all of that. And these are cleaning the welding tips because, you know, they get dirty and clogged when you're welding. All that crud comes up and all that. All right, and then it shows you to get the thing going. Um, you have to start the fire with the fuel gas. So which one's that going to be? That's going to be your acetylene. So you turn your acetylene uh, knob, and then you use that striker. <laughs> you get a spark. Then you get that going, and you'll see all this soot. And you get it to where it lifts off a little bit until you get rid of all the soot. Then you start adding the oxygen, and you want to get a neutral flame. There's a carburizing flame where you have more acetylene. There's an oxidizing flame where you have more oxygen. You want to get it somewhere in the middle. You have a nice little flame. Uh, oxygen hose fittings, if you look at it. Right-hand threads. And then for acetylene... Their left-hand threads. That way, you can't confuse which one goes where and which nozzle because it's it's set up just right, and uh, you know you could cause an explosion if you mix the wrong way and all that. So they've tried to make it foolproof. Now you just say, well, I'll just get a bigger wrench and just jam and strip those in. No, 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 no. You should you should be able to get these in finger tight. And then if you do have to tighten them, you follow the instructions. I've seen one where you do have to tighten them more with a wrench. But you follow the instructions. These are things you don't want to be cramping down, clamping down real hard. And 
showing how strong you are because you'll strip them out and break them. Usually all this stuff is brass and all that. So just make sure you read the instructions for the, the rig, the outfit that you have. Uh, and then there's our little mixing chamber for it. And there's different torch tips depending on what size thickness metal or what type of metal that you're doing. There's your oxygen valve and your settling valve. And you get used to all this stuff. And here's one. You can tell there's our oxygen, there's our acetylene. And there's, you know, your gauges to tell you and all your torch kitting. You know, you can buy these at Home Depot, Lowe's, whatever. And then you can change that out to where it's cutting, although I think it's not cutting yet. Here's for welding. And then your different uh, welding rods. Uh, or you can have brazing rods where you're doing at a lower temperature, you know, just above 800 degrees or what have you. When welding, you get much higher. Uh, flat, high strength, self-fluxing alloy for copper to copper without flux. And copper to bronze with, you know, it shows you the type of flux. Preheating is recommended for some application. And you can buy all these things. Uh, and then there's your valve cylinders. What they do is they also have these safety discs. Let's say there's a big fire. And if you didn't have these safety discs, what would happen? It would build up pressure in the tank, bottle, cylinder, whatever you want to call it. And then that whole thing would explode and rupture, and there would be shrapnel. You're talking thick metal for those welding tanks, cylinders, whatever. And that would become ripping out that shrapnel into people's heads and faces and killing them. So it's best to have it where the, it gets hot, there's a big fire, and then it just lets that gas out. Yeah, it causes the fire to spurt out sideways like that. But the bottles don't explode and cause bombs going off and shrapnel. Plus, if that thing blew up, that bottle, it would shoot straight up in the air like a rocket and then come down somewhere halfway across Dallas or whatever through your roof right through uh, through your head through the slab you know kill a lot of people so it's best to have it that way then here's our different flames and a good neutral flame uh, where you can see the the inner flame in here and there's not as much sizzling and stuff and you can tell when you have a nice little blue inner flame oh, it looks nice uh, okay Welding's at 6,000 degrees, you know, for welding steel. Uh, brazing is above 800. And then soldering is below 800. You know, especially if you're uh, silver soldering, you know, your copper pipes and doing some plumbing. And then again, here's the rig. Here's our oxygen cylinder. Like I said, it's usually the taller one, except for these specially made ones. Or was it back here? Yeah, where you can buy this little portable thing. But for the most of the cylinders that you purchase somewhere, or you rent them, the demerge charge, where you rent them until you use up the gas, and then you call up the company and they'll switch them off. And that way you don't have to buy the bottles and that. All you have to buy is that welding kit. And then you just pay so much each month for using it, and then when you run out, they switch them out for you. You know, they factor that in. Or they can charge you per how much you use up in a bottle. It just depends on how you want to set up that deal. And then when you're done, you take off this rig and you always put the caps when you're transporting. Because if this breaks off, like I said, that could come out pressure. This could shoot off like a rocket. You know, like those CO2 cars, those CO2 rockets, you puncture the end and shoo, those cars would race. Same thing. And you can't imagine this thing shooting up in the air and coming down. It's pretty heavy. It's a good projectile that could kill you and a lot of other people. And then here's a manifold system. When I was uh, teaching at A&M, had to teach some welding. That's what they did. It was in the back uh, by the loading dock so the guys could come in. They could roll in those cylinders, and those bottles, if you will, and uh, put it on a manifold system because we had 20 or 30 different welding booths. This way we didn't have to have all these bottles inside the welding booths, especially 
when you've got beginners, they have no idea what they're doing, and they're welding on the on the bottles, and yeah, that that's not a good thing. So, anyhow. All right, this is kind of interesting. Don't you click on it. I think this, luckily, my virus protection got rid of it. This shows you uh, an accident that happened. Um, yeah, what they did was, this was a plumber. He had his little welding outfit in, inside his little plumber's van. Somehow it got uh, the acetylene. Uh, was that he didn't turn it all the way closed it was left open a little and it was on the actual uh, I believe welding torch itself too was left open they didn't shut it tight and so it was filling up on a nice hot day in their van all that acetylene sealed pretty well and then they're not sure but either he went to push the remote to unlock the car or a cell phone went off in the front of his van and you'll see a picture of it here yeah I guess it was a Toyota truck and then boom that thing went up and that's what they're showing here pieces of it all over the place the damage that it did obviously it blew out the windows it blew out his eardrum yeah, blew out of the glass and the neighbors in there there's one door or frame to it and uh, yeah it blew out the ruined this car next to it as well and the boat blew out all the windows there and the, around that neighborhood yeah look how close the the actual houses are so that was not a good thing yeah there's the actual what's left of it the wreckage there and pieces you know a few yards over there's the rear side panel of the van or truck whatever it was front of a boat that was next to it so there's pieces everywhere oh god look at that there's the front of it there's the seats and all that there's the guys investigating the accident oh there's pieces on the house passenger side door of the vehicle and then a part that went right through the roof like I said so you gotta be careful so I did a lot of damage there wasn't a good thing. So that's why I'm saying welding, safety, acetylene. You know, it's a flammable gas. You have to be careful. Yeah, there's all the glass that broke out there. I guess it didn't do it there, but it hit this guy's windows too. So, Anyhow, it can do a lot of damage. But what's interesting about acetylene, uh, you know, most gases you can pressurize them more, but Gaseous acetylene is highly unstable, explosive above 15 psi. That's it, 15 pounds per square inch. Uh, what is inside your tank is a blanket of fiber soaked with liquid acetone with the acetylene in uh, solution. Never leave a tank on its side. Oh no. And so again, there it is. This had long fiber asbestos back in the day when you can do all that stuff monolithic filler or even balsa wood will work in here and these have the safety fuse plug so the whole thing doesn't explode you know and there's the removable cap metal cap but anyhow excuse me um, you're welding showing here weld 30 to 45 degrees and as you can see here uh, it's a forward motion that they're doing with this. Uh, or you can do backhand for thicker pieces here, these two base metals that they're filling up because they're using a welding rod, okay, which is like a filler rod there, and they're filling it up. So they're heating the metal and then they're filling that stuff in there. Slow, takes a lot of skill. This was really before uh, they had the weld. You see a lot of this like in muffler shops. I had a guy do a MIG welder on my exhaust system and oh, it was just an awful mess. With this you can play with it and get yourself a nice bead or you could even braze the stuff together if you wanted to. Uh, and you can do a nicer job around round stuff. That guy wasn't a good welder. He tried to round, you know, weld around pipe, and oh, it was awful. 
you know, it's, it's one of my nice muscle cars. And I was just, I was wondering why it was so inexpensive. So I'll just, uh, I'll wait till it rots out and then I'll buy those ones where you can, for 700 bucks, you put it all together, clamp it, and you're good to go. All right, anyhow. Oxyacetylene welding advantages. Equipment is very portable. Equipment is relatively inexpensive. Less than $200, 100 bucks for a good setup for that. Uh, and then you can either get the bottles or again you can get a pay a demerge charge and just rent the bottles and then when you're done have them pick them up and then you've, you've paid them for every month that you use them. Ability to weld a variety of materials, flame is easily controlled and used extensively on sheet metal that's why it's good on muffler systems and that you're not gonna go burn a hole through it as easily. Limitations, low deposition rate and operator factor but again if you're just doing sheet metal it's fine low weld quality and the demerge charge for the tank rental. All right, then we get into air carbon arc cutting. This is for, and if you look at this, uh, and it's got a deal where there's the carbon electrode, uh, and then it has usually a place where the air will come through. And that's for gouging, like if you put the two plates together, and then use this air carbon arc that gives you your V or your U and then you'll weld and that way you know for fr thick plates that way you can weld your beads in it because if you just butt them and if you don't have like a plasmark welder and you try to weld it's not going to go that deep and so you're only welding fusing half the thickness of the metal so where the weld is is going to be weak and usually you want your weld to be stronger than the base material that's usually what people are shooting for when they're welding is where the weld at. It should never break at the weld. It, can, it should break somewhere else. So an arc cutting process in which metals to be cut, excuse me, are melted by the heat of the carbon arc and the molten metal is removed by a blast of air. Okay, the process is highly effective on cast iron and gouging steel plates in preparation for V-groove or U-groove welding and man it blows that stuff everywhere makes a big mess and this is just showing you about a five degree depending on how you're doing this typically five to ten degrees and so you can get that stuff out there and blast it out take a big chunk out there's the air jets again carbon electrode now you shouldn't really be you're not this isn't a welding rod right this is a carbon electrode so i mean eventually it'll wear away but no it's not supposed to be for welding it's for cutting stuff out uh, then we get into plasma cutting now here uh we did we talked about oxyacetylene cutting with that extra attachment on there and if you've ever done that, it takes a while to where you get it right, and then you're trying to cut it, and you don't have it just right, and then the puddle's fusing back again, and you really kind of have to know and play with it. Now, this plasmark's pretty good. You set it up, the timer, this, and you go along, and <laughs> you see these sparks everywhere, but it cuts it, you know, half or eighth, you know, that much thinner than oxyacetylene cutting. And if you hold it right, you can get a nice, straight, perfect cut. I've seen these things where they set them up as a CNC machine Shh. and you know go back and forth on an XY axis and cut stuff out nice and neat and it gives you a nice smooth cut so it's a lot better than your oxyacetylene cutting it shows you again because it's plasma 30,000 uh, Fahrenheit and higher uh, it gets you a real hot stream of ionized gas and it makes it for a thinner cut and a smoother cut. And all the extra crud that comes out is called the dross. The dross is a mass of solid impurities floating on a molten metal. So the dross as a solid is distinguished from slag, which is a liquid. Because you know, they, they talk about dross, so that way you know. All right, plasma cutting equipment. This is a nice little portable one by Miller. Uh, I mean, a, a Lincoln. Miller has one, too. Um, and Hyperdyne or 
hyperthymic. I'll, I'll look. They have it here. There's the ones that invented it. But anyhow, a thermal hyperdyme or something. Yeah, thermal cutting process used uh, to sever or remove metal by means of the chemical reaction of oxygen with the base metal at elevated temperatures. Again, the reason we have oxyacetylene cutting, it came before plasma arc. Plasma is relatively new. It started coming around in the 80s, mid 80s, uh, where everybody then started using it. Uh, the price came down, the patents came off, and everybody started making them. There's more competition. Heat of oxyacetylene flame is used to bring the base metal up to its kindling temperature. At this point, it ignites and burns. This again is with your oxyacetylene welding equipment that you can put this cutting attachment. So here's your welding tips. And then you can loosen that up. You know, these would be on there. And then you put this on there. This setup. And then it has that little, you, you preheat it. And then when you press that lever, it gives you that blast of oxygen. I believe it's in the middle. And then, or it's on these extra little orifices on the outside. I forget. We'll look. But anyhow, it's been a while since I've had to play with one. I don't have one anymore. And then it shoots that extra stream of oxygen. And as you know, uh, when they were trying to make steel, that's, you know, the Bronze Age and all that. Then they realized if they had those bellows and added extra, you know, oxygen in there, then they got higher, hotter temperatures, and then they could form steel. And the same thing here. It's hotter, and so it'll sever and cut right through it. All right, well, that's it for that section. There'll be a quiz on this, as usual. There's always a quiz. But the quiz will cover, you know, again, with these quizzes, I know people are complaining and what have you. It may have stuff on the first thing we covered the first day. Uh, you know, I try to, but usually uh, there's only so much you can do. And I, it may just cover what was on here. But the intent is we are going to have a midterm, so you should know all of it. So the, the intent is that when you get out of here, some employer is going to ask you a few questions, or you may be in charge of a welding department that, hey, you better know something about it. Now, I apologize that we don't actually get to weld. But hopefully, you know, if uh, the governor and, and what have you uh, in Texas sign, we're, we're supposed to get a new uh, business and technology building, and then they were going to, on the first floor, we're going to have some labs, and we'd be able to actually get some real welders and do all this stuff. But right now, I mean, we have a good taste of a lot of the manufacturing. We have a spot welder. We have machining. We have CNC and robotics. And, you know, it's all air-conditioned. It's all in a small little lab. And so it's not bad. When I was at A&M, yeah, we had welding and we had all this stuff. My God, they were in these huge buildings. They opened up the overhead doors and put the big fans on. And we had these summer classes. Oh, my God, it's 100 degrees. and You're sweating to death doing all this stuff. So this is kind of good in one sense. And then if you get a chance, I've seen, uh, what is it, Harbor Freight. They have specials on like MIG welders and stick welders, and you can even see them at Walmart and, and various places uh, for $100. And you say, oh, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a crappy machine. But, you know, if you're just putting two little pieces together, thinner stuff, not real thick plate, these things work well. Like I was welding on some subframe connectors for my car because of the torque. You know, it's unibody and it was causing it to bend. <laughs> put a big motor big cam in there and they work really well and then for replacing a quarter panel that was rusted and beat up and heck you can buy a whole new quarter panel now instead of having to put a whole bunch of bondo in and all that stuff and what's good is you get those low temperatures with this stuff and you can weld pretty nicely with these things when they have little thin wire for MIG welding and all that, so you know it was 110 bucks free shipping. You know, and it, and it works good. It has these little spools and all that, and I was impressed. So anyhow, uh, something to play with. You know, I know you're saying I could use 100 dollars for something else, but 
if you're interested and you have to fix things every once in a while and you're having to drill holes in this, if you had this little welder and that, it, it's kind of neat. And it's so much quicker and easier to use. So, and it gives you a little practice. All right, I guess that's enough about that. I'll put another quiz out.